let's uh, start our book presentation of today. Welcome, everyone. Uh, happy to see you and all in this European winter time. I think I, I made that very clear <laughs> with the mails. Uh, this day, today, we are real focus on a fascinating book, Games and Visual Culture in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, edited by Vanina Kopp and Elizabeth Lapina and published by Brepols. Our referent today is my close colleague, Sibylle Lamas, specialist in contemporary gaming and play studies. And I will tell you more about her uh, when I introduce her. Before giving the floor to the editors, I will shortly present them to you. Vanina Kopp, who will go and start with the presentation, is professor of the history of the European Middle Ages and its cultures at the University of Passau in Bavaria. Before that, she was heading a Franco-German research group on medieval games and competition at the German Historical Institute in Paris. She finished, finished her PhD, a co-tutelle, with the University of Bielefeld, Germany, and the École des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris in 2013, with the monograph On der König und die Bücher, that came out in 2016 as a result of that PhD as a historical anthropology of reading at the French court and the use of the Royal Library. A second monograph on medieval game studies has been awarded a habilitation at the University of Münster and is currently in preparation for publication. Vanina, the floor is yours. I first gonna put your slide on. If I'm not mistaken, it's this one, huh? Yes, perfect. All uh... right. I apologize for not being able to turn on my camera. I guess uh, maybe the camera is, is uh, tired because I just recorded my 90 minutes lecture just before <laughs> jumping into the book launch. So maybe, you know, maybe the material is just getting tired and wants to be, you know, in the weekend <laughs> soon. So but thank you for having me and thank you for having us. I'm sorry for not being able to show my face to you. Um, yeah, so uh, what do you want to say? So. I came to medieval games when I stumbled upon a heraldic manual of the French court from around 1400s uh, when I was working on my habilitation. Um, it, it was from a group of men in a play community. Um, and this community was, as the charter states, a remedy in times of plague. And the charter showed the coats of arms and it was collected over, the, over a period of 40 years. So what happened in this community? Um, so nobles and courtiers would come together in a sort of order. They would write poems dedicated to love and marriage and devotion and compete in literary competitions. There would also be a jury of women. And I later discovered that you know similar orders have been created in urban lay confraternities. Um, and so me as a historian, mostly working on text, wanted to explore the borders between reading and society and public performance. But then from that performance, I came into game studies. Um, and I mean, it sounds maybe very broad um, to say that, but play is, I mean, a universal, a universal feature in life of, for humans um, who play anywhere and any time. And play seems to comprise a fundamental part of every culture whether manifested in religious context or in simple pastimes, transformed into games with regular rules. And in present day westernized societies, play is considered part of carefree time, leisure time, and mostly entertainment. And in the pre-modern Western world, however, uh, play lay at the core of more complex, profound activities and the ludic provided an essential vector of religious, social, and cultural communication. It thus structured life and the interaction um, of people uh, in medieval societies. It enabled the processing of the sacred, and it offered a serious means to manifest social prestige and political practices. Um, so uh, the late Middle Ages mostly witnessed the sportification, um, in, in times of peace. So um, the games that probably come to your mind are immediately ball uh, sports uh, with balls like football or tennis, archery, horse racing, tournaments, jousting, and also theatrical 
carnivalesque shows. And such competitions allow participants to live out agonistic tendencies and to display status and prestige. And they also foster so so social groups and group coherence. Um, so in for the studies of the medieval uh, period, game studies along these lines have ascended into recent historiography, though, of course, they have a longer scholarly tradition um, because, I mean, obviously, several disciplines have conceptualized games and play in sociological, anthropological, and historical ways. And, I mean, the canonical definition of games um, has been laid out by Johann Heusinger in um, his book Homo Ludens, a study of the play element in culture, which of course, I'm sorry, I can't uh, pronounce um, in Flemish. <laughs> um, and uh, this was a seminal contribution to both game and medieval studies. Um, and the flamboyant rhetoric and the clear narrative of Heusinger's Homo Ludens still confer uh, a special place uh, to it in game studies. Um, back in the 80s, uh, well, we have we have another development of games, especially on the specific pastimes, festivities, the tournaments, jousting, um, and this helped to yeah to analyze urban and courtly context. And this wave of research in the recent years helped to establish games and the institutionalized forms as important academic topics and uh, the renewal of um, the themes that I've already mentioned before um, have now been analyzed under um, the focus of animal studies um, or other turns in cultural history. And they have helped to analyze ludic forms um, anew, especially the physical games, but also children's games, and have encouraged a discussion of games and narrations to new um, to new spaces such as monasteries or to cultural practices such as folklore. And this is where I want to come to uh, the image that I'm showing on the slide, which is also um, the, on the cover of our book um, and also a little bit, yeah, contour why, why we chose this. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, it's a scene set in the princely court where play and leisure provided major components of the aristocratic lifestyle. Um, not only did the nobility define itself through its um, sometimes exclusive prerogatives, such as hunting as falconry, which is exclusively uh, aristocratic, not uh, jousting, for example. Jousting could be totally urban and non-noble. Um, the courtly sphere also practiced an, ex uh, an extremely high refinement in its leisure activities and is shown, um, yeah, as, as it is, for, for example, shown around chess, which is here at the core of this image, um, chess being the noble strategic game per excellence. And chess, and if we widen this up to the tabletop games, brings us closer to the field we, Elizabeth and I, wanted to explore with this volume on games and visual culture. Um, the ability to play chess uh, was one of the identifying markers of aristocrats, and it recalls comparison between the tabletop game and combat. Um, the specificity is that it's without any physical effort or violence. So it's kind of also sublimitating um, uh, yeah, the violent agonistic society in which people evolve. The presence of the women in this scene, um, not only in this image, but also in a lot of descriptions of courtly scenes, uh, brings a further assortment of associations having to do with chess and tabletop games. Um, the game, for example, Game of Loves, conversational games, which confer or convey norms of comportment in relations between the genders, but also between all members of the courtly society. So using this image of chess and the play community highlights how the rules of tabletop games regulate any kind of social interaction between the genders, but also between the states and different social groups that meet in gaming situations. So um, the study, or well, the scope of the books, accordingly 
um, differentiates the social aims and functions of various tabletop men that men and women could play together, but also different, you know, people coming from different parts of the society. Um, and it highlights the particularities of numerous cultural expressions of play. Um, and as I said, the exchanges involve the men and women alike, but also secular and religious spheres. Um, they happen in urban spaces between people from different um, estates or different parts of society. Um, so um, they also foster the relations, whether real or imagined, between different countries and also cultures as games permeate also um, cultures and are vectors of cultural um, transfers. Uh, because, well, I mean, games themselves and game-related representations and artifacts traveled widely and became adapted and adopted by other societies. And we've tried to also highlight this um, with the scope of our book uh, that we hope is not only centered on um, European, the Latin uh, European um, geographical area. So uh, we also wanted to explore further the material, the material dimension of those tabletop games and the visual aspect. And this is why I hand over to my colleague and co-editor Elizabeth, who will dive into this part um, of the book presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Vanina. That was very revealing to see how, on the one hand, uh, we have a different definition of gaming. And that's why I'm also looking forward to uh, the presentation or the response of uh, Sibylle regarding that. But first, let me introduce uh, uh, Elizabeth to you, sorry, <laughs> Elizabeth Lapina is an historian of the Middle Ages with a research focus on the history of the Crusades, which is rather surprising when you're now dealing with games. In her fourth monograph, uh, Warfare and the Miraculous, Penn State 2015, she examines several chronicles of the First Crusade to uncover the existence of sophisticated and often conflicting interpretations of the event. In her second monograph, previously entitled Depicting the Holy War, she deals with visual sources to demonstrate that, compared to texts, images provide a different point of view on the perceptions of the Crusades, the Crusaders and the Muslim enemy. But Elizabeth is also interested in games in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and co-edited the book we are presenting today. Thank you for being here. The floor is yours and I'm going to put your PowerPoint on, which is... If I'm not mistaken, this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Stein and Sibylle, for inviting us and for organizing this. And uh, thank you for the audience uh, for being here. And as Stein has mentioned, uh, unlike Vanina, I am not the most logical person uh, to have edited uh, this volume. I personally, in my free time, do enjoy uh, different tabletop games. Uh, also, as a teacher, I know that many of my students sign up for my classes because they really enjoy uh, medievalist uh, video games. But I'm a historian of crusades, and I work primarily on, on chronicles. So why games and why visual sources? Uh, as I was reading chronicles of crusades, I began to find lots of references to games, especially dice, uh, sometimes chess in my sources. I began to collect them and was uh, struck by the variety of contexts in which those references appear. Stories about games were clearly not only or even primarily about games. Then I decided to venture out into visual culture and examine some visual sources, such as uh, the one on the screen. So this is a page from a late uh, 13th century manuscript uh, of a chronicle written by William of Tyre. The illumination on the screen depicts a joint operation by the Byzantines and the Franks as they besieged the Muslim castle of Shizar in 1138. However, according to William of Tyre, while uh, the Byzantines 
led by Emperor John, were very busy with the siege, his Frankish allies, Raymond of Antioch and Jocelyn II of Edessa, spent their time playing games. So eventually, uh, Emperor John, getting no help from the Franks, ended up lifting the siege. So on the bottom half, John, Emperor John, arrives at the camp to find Raymond and Jocelyn busy playing chess. So on the elimination, the battle scene on the top half with a turbaned enemy about to be slain contrasts with the scene of leisure uh, below. So the story if, uh, is one of many illustrations found in the Chronicle by William of Tyre that blames Frankish misfortunes on Frankish immoral behavior, uh, or in this case, uh, borderline immoral behavior. Some things, as I looked at this image, were, were puzzling to me. So why are Raymond and Jocelyn playing chess while uh, the text describes games of chance? Why are they sitting uh, on the ground and not at a table? Uh, have they become too much like their Muslim enemies? So uh, in addition to illuminations, I also began looking at uh, archaeological evidence that survives from Crusader states. And that has to do with games, such as uh, graffiti of uh, nine men's mores found in a variety of locations. And this archaeological evidence is no less interesting and oftentimes no less puzzling than uh, this illumination or any text uh, that you can find. So uh, if you want to learn more about gambling and gaming on crusades and in crusader states, we simply cannot ignore visual and material culture. And Vanina has made it clear that games are not just a frivolous pastime. Um, they are also about power, they are also about gender, they are about religion. Uh, in my case, and in many cases, they are about uh, interfaith relations, etc., etc., etc. So, for example, learning about gaming and gambling in Crusader States tells us quite a lot about not just daily life, but also about, once again, interfaith relations uh, on all levels, from ordinary, in quotation marks, uh, marks, people to kings and emirs and diplomatic relations, and also about um, medieval perceptions of crusades and explanations of the successes and failures. So the best, uh, I wanted to find out if our colleagues across the disciplines are also finding out not only that games are important, but also if um, they're also trying to study uh, the entire range of sources, uh, including visual and material sources that allow us to learn about games. And the best way to learn about something, I, I find, is to edit a volume. So here's, uh, here's, here's the volume. And uh, I found it really interesting that two of the articles uh, in the volume have been co-edited, uh, have been co-written uh, by uh, art historians, um, uh, archaeologists, uh, and specialists uh, in literary sources. And other articles uh, have been written by art historians, historians, and archaeologists who often ventured beyond the confines of the disciplines to incorporate both texts, um, images, and, and artifacts as well in the attempts to learn more about games. So we're not the first ones, and I hope we will not be uh, the last ones uh, to challenge this wall dividing uh, our, uh, our disciplines. Uh, also, what uh, is interesting about games, which is something that Vanina has mentioned, is that they're both uh, universal, everybody plays games, but also at the same time that the details of how the games are played and how this play is represented is very specific to a time and a location. So another wall uh, that we try to contribute to breaking down, once again, we're not the first ones and we will not be the last ones, um, is the wall separating studies of Western and uh, non-Western games. 
we have incorporated two articles dealing with uh, Turkey and beyond, and this is not just not tokenism. I do believe that games uh, are a particular fitting field uh, for, for global studies. And I do hope in the future to see more studies going in that, in that direction. So I hope, I hope um, as an outsider uh, to, to games, I hope uh, this volume serves as an encouragement for scholars like myself, regarding, regardless of the primary uh, specialization, uh, the primary field, to take games seriously. I also hope that scholars like myself, who are not art historians or uh, archaeologists, uh, do take uh, images and and objects um, seriously. So thank you, thank you for for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for this uh, this presentation. Uh, maybe in the Q and A we can go a bit further on all the contributions and what they exactly do. For example, I am really interested in the old graffiti, but mm -hmm. that can be for uh, for the Q and A. Uh, let's go to the PowerPoint of Sibylle, and then I introduce Sibylle to you. Uh, Sibylle Lamas is full professor in New Media and Digital Culture at Leiden University. She has been a visiting senior research fellow at the University of Manchester and has worked as a researcher at the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies at the University of Warwick, as well as the Media Study Departments of Utrecht University and the University of Amsterdam. Her background is in media studies and game studies, which she has always approached from an interdisciplinary angle, including cultural studies, science and technology studies, post-colonial studies and critical geography. She is co-editor of Playful Identities 2015, Mapping Time 2017, The Routledge Handbook of Interdisciplinary Research Methods 2018 and The Playful Citizen. 2017. She is an ERC laureate and has been the PI of numerous research projects. She is a member of the Playful Mapping Collective. Sibylle, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation to be the referent of this book. The floor is yours. Thank you, Stein. Please, I didn't tie my re uh, presentation, so tell me when I'm going off time and I'll wrap it up. All right. um, it's good. I find it uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I find it a real honor to uh, be part of this. I am. I think it's a fantastic edited volume. I wanted to say to Elizabeth and Vanina, for someone who is actually not from this, you know, I'm a contemporary scholar on the whole. Um, it's very, uh, very interesting to read this. And I think um, makes me very enthusiastic as well to think further, as I will also show in this presentation, about how you can think about play in different contexts. So I quickly thought about a title, Past Playgrounds, Present Playgrounds. And uh, as a background, I have a background. Um, I, I wrote a lot about games, but also about post-colonialism and games. Mm. I wrote about uh, urban playgrounds, about play and born and confinement. And in those uh, discussions, I always also had a keen eye for the historical part of uh, playing and not only games. As you say in your introduction as well, that difference is not always very clear, right? Between play and games, depending also on the language you speak and Housinga, of course, spoke Dutch and spell is the word we have for both in Dutch. Um, in this... Um, Presentation, I, I would like to give the people already a bit of food for thought and discussion. And I want to um, talk about games as playgrounds in a way and how I always have been uh, approaching that um, and how I actually, to make it more precise, have always struggled and loved the work of Housinga when it's about the magic circle. And um, I have been doing work on how set are those borders, how soft can they be, and um, also on how um, there can be a tension between the hardness of the magic circle, like, for example, also in religious uh, uh, um, um, rituals, you could say, 
and the freedom play uh, gives you, as Huizinga famously said, it's always voluntary. So that's also a thing when you get sort of confined in a circle, how voluntary is it? Um, so there is this sort of um, tension there between freedom of play and set borders in daily life, but specif specifically in games and play. And I started, and there I come more towards the history part. I started to, I see one of my pictures doesn't show, but I started also in my work about urban playgrounds, I started to get interested in the history of playgrounds. And I started, as you already also did in your presentation, to be very interested in when did playgrounds become more demarcated, right? Is that a historical thing? Of course it is. But how and when? And of course, in a way, that whole idea of the magic circle relates to a moment in history, namely the, uh, the, the, the early uh, 20th century, in which uh, we were in a modernist time when things started to become more de demarcated. So binaries were constructed. This also very much relates to the work of Foucault, right? That you oversee a playground and can see what people are doing and um, yeah. So uh, it, the, 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 there are these binaries which may be, and that's for, very interesting for me to learn more about also through that, this book, between work and leisure, for example, uh, with the indust industrial age, between child and adult, something you touch upon as well in your book, between public and private, between nature and culture as well, and also, of course, not to forget the, uh, the, the, the sort of, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the opposition between the urban and the rural. So I started to get interested, was that the only playground there is? And of course it is, and there always have been playgrounds, which are, are more liminal spaces, you know, a term from anthropology in which you, you there's far more a sort of in-between state, which is neither in or outside the uh, magic circle, so to speak. And in contemporary culture, there are a lot of examples of that. Here I have a couple of them. Soldiers, I think they're playing chess actually. Uh, in, in in you know during or waiting for a war to start or a, or a battle to start again, um, but also uh, modern uh, digital means like uh, 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 Minecraft or just playing on the beach, or of course for art historians as well, the Situationist who literally wanted to lift up the pavements to um, make the city a playground. And then I started to wonder, um, is that something which is only uh, from this time or is that also something we could sort of see change over time? So um, in a way, um, these makeshift playgrounds and these soft borders, how does that, how can you uh, situate that historically? that we can see that we always have had that. Some of our childhood memories are precisely about those makeshift playgrounds. Uh, but my question really is, and that may be also something maybe for the discussion, those playgrounds have always existed. Were they that deline delineated as they became in the 20th century? Or were they maybe less demarcated in the past? And I try to find an answer to that, but as I already indicated, I'm not a historian, so I sort of uh, miss, the, miss the tools to, to find that. Um, there are things I was thinking about, which I would like to discuss with you as well. Like, for example, the, 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 the playing cards I, I show in the left uh, corner of this uh, uh, slide um, were, of course, also used to play with, but also for, for seeing a fortune telling, right? So tarot cards and play cards were basically the same thing. I also put a photograph, uh, a painting of people playing at a table. That table is to drink from, right? It's literally a tabletop, but that shifts into something you can play a game on. And of course, we all remember those tables as well, which are inlaid to play games at the same time as maybe having a drink. So that's also, although it's smaller, that's also a playground with a shifting function and then of course squares which could one time be used for a theatrical uh, spectacle but and the, on the, on the, uh, at other moments could have another actually also another playful uh, function to stay close to uh, what Stein for example wrote about. 
about um, how uh, play is also theatre, of course, uh, in public spaces. So I'm very interested in this. And then we also have examples, of course, of things which are more delineated, like the arena, for example, or the Olympic Games. Now, there's one project which I think links very well to uh, what you have just been presented and what the book is about, but approaches this from a, a slightly different angle. And that is the project I'm at the moment conducting with my close uh, colleagues, Angus Moll and Aris Politopoulos, and that's the Past at Play Lab. And here we really try to develop methods to look at history and games. And I wanted to uh, show a bit about, I wanted to tell you a tiny bit about a project and through that maybe think about how can we move this field forward of understanding games also in a material, material sense that were uh, that from the past, basically. So what we do um, in this, um, and I think I have the wrong slides here, but it doesn't matter that much. Maybe you could take just a, the, could you, Take it down the slides, please, uh, Stein. Um, thank you. So what we do in this project is we um, do two things. We start from the same thing as you do in the book, like play is culture. So play is also historical, right? And is history. And in this lab, uh, we ask people uh, two things. And we're in the first stage also because of Corona a bit uh, delayed. Um, that we ask uh, people to play old games and we record that and we have interviews with people and we have surveys uh, and we ask them to play the game of Ur and Senet and look at how they actually deal with the rules of those games. So instead of also having visual clues like you Elizabeth talked about, uh, Aris by the way is an archaeologist as well, um, and we actually now use 3D uh, printers to reprint those games, but eventually we would also like to uh, recreate those games with the original materials with participants to see what the materiality of those games are. And we also ask uh, the participant questions like, where do you think this game would be played? Would it be in a church? Would it be on a market? Would it be by soldiers, etc.? Do you think it's important to win this game, etc.? We know that games were played differently because often when you lost, you kept playing a game, for example. Um, so it's it's very interesting to do that through experimental uh, uh, playing again a game, basically. So that's one part of the project, um, which is already yielding quite interesting results, despite the lack of participants because of Corona. And the other side is that we also want to play with, uh, want to study people playing contemporary computer games where history plays an important part mm -hmm. and ask them how do, uh, how do you um, uh, experience history through these games? So we're still in the middle of this project and it's a relatively small project financially, but we have a lot of, we invest a lot in it ourselves, so to speak. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to think both from this more visual culture perspective, although we, we, we use that as well to a certain extent, like you do in the book, and combine that with methodologies which are really about um, the experience of playing, which you do to a certain extent uh, include in the book as well, especially when you talk about the multisensorial uh, part of games. But I, I would, I, I'm very excited with how that could actually enrich each other. So um, thank you very much for the book. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, uh, I find it very inspiring also how it's sometimes actually still the same now or sometimes different because I, I'm sorry for Nina, but I don't think that games are less complex now than they were then. <laughs> they have a different cultural function. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting for me as someone ma mainly, but not only as I just showed, looking at games from a contemporary perspective to see how that compares and how you could work with that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to say. And then I think, I hope you get yes. some interesting questions 
from yeah you. sure interesting very interesting maybe i better let react uh, elizabeth and vanina on your uh input and then uh, go to the q a of the the people present so so elizabeth or vanina well i could say something about the historical developments of games and of malls and of spaces um i would yes please i would maybe start with that um Great. i mean there is there is of course um, research about how games develop because i mean also the middle ages is not homogeneous and of course there are games that have been inherited from antiquity although um i mean the games um um left in a way the the, the very regulated um uh, city um of, of antiquity uh, and became more it invested more spaces uh, in in towns or outside, um, and it became more ubiquitous and more entangled in every part of society, and not very delimited in times and spaces. Um, this is something that we like. This is very broad. What I'm saying, uh, we really uh, realize or we really see um, as, uh, as um, a shift around 1500s with a codification of the rules also in written forms with the establishing of spaces and also times for games so this is what i mentioned briefly um, in um, with the sportification so something like um, hunting uh, becomes suddenly um, a more specific horse race or um, the military um, archery becomes um, a more specific uh, competition for archery. And um, this is also the time when malls developed. So spaces mostly outside of the city, also for security reasons, um, to uh, limit um, these games and also maybe to control these games for the municipality or for the worldly as well as clerical authorities um, to, yeah, to to create spaces and times and regulate um, games. Um, it has also, like some researchers have also pointed out to the spectacularization, I don't know if this is the right word in English, um, of games when, um, yeah, when, when um, they, uh, games become something for themselves, like they are not so much embedded anymore in religious contexts, uh, like for example tennis, which was played by monks yeah. originally, um, it becomes something different, I mean, and, um, and games become a means for, I mean, they always have, but they, with the rules and with manuals, they become um, they, they become a mean to regulate bodies and minds mm -hmm. and also gestures and words. Um, so this is something where uh, along the 14th up to the 15th century with the codification, with the specification of games, um, something changes in society and it moves um, towards, I mean, something that we try to grasp by sportification, spectralization. Um, and specific, and, and we also realize that they are that they, they that we have more words in the sources to describe the names of the games, um, although they don't they, they don't have to explain them because it's so clear for everyone. So nowadays historians are really wondering <laughs> what these games could be, um, and yeah, and the card games that you showed. I mean, this is a very nice example for tabletop games and for the mixture of of games that um, because I mean card games were popular all through society. I mean, not only with soldiers, but uh, we have lists of deb debts, like money um, that were owed by princes. Um, uh, card games really um, took over uh, the popularity of dices uh, in certain circles mm -hmm. from the 16th century on, for example. But it's always very hard to, pin to, 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 to point, pinpoint it down, uh, but it is clear that there are um, yeah, developments in between games and the function, the social functions of games in societies, in different societies. Mm -hmm. I just have a, a very, well, if I may, yes, I have a very yes, sure. quick, quick comment that I, I, I really loved the idea of recreating 
recreating uh, medieval games and noting how they're played. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely would like to learn more about this project. And um, as you've been talking about it, I'm thinking about ways of to incorporating it um, into my teaching, my right. undergraduate teaching, and having the students discuss uh, to what extent we can reproduce uh, those games and to what extent we cannot. Yeah. Uh, and including the materiality, I find it very interesting that you, um, you, I think you, in the beginning, you're going to print those games from 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 plastic, I assume. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We and then, that yeah, of course. Yeah, there, can... There's also because I'm not the archaeologist on the team, yeah. but there's, there's one of the, I think the game of Ur has one uh, one manual as well, actually, mm -hmm. on a clay tablet. So mm -hmm. we also thought how would it be if you have someone recreating it with the rules or you have them writing the rules afterwards so you can mm -hmm. sort of uh mm -hmm. yeah play around with the parameters you set in that way mm -hmm. and see what what because those games were not only made once and they didn't mm -hmm. have one annual often but they mm -hmm. were reduced somewhere else and the and the rules could also shift slightly right mm -hmm. or quite practically sometimes mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent, excellent way to to think to what extent we can, we can recreate the Middle Ages and what extent we cannot. But what are, yeah. there are limitations as well. So I, I would like why in in a medieval class it would be nice to combine it with playing video historical video games as well. That maybe right. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Sort of reflection on yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would like to, to to keep in touch with you and uh, yeah, learn definitely. more about yeah. the project. Great. And, and how far does this also correspond with the, the first contribution in your book by Catherine Forsyth mm -hmm. and Mark mm -hmm. Howe, where they look at an, archeo uh, an archaeological evidence as well as literary mm -hmm. descriptions of games? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and but... also... oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah. And they also took it, uh, uh, take a look at. Um, the, the the sensations of of playing games the, the entire experience of playing games of of how it felt to play games the, the light yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's also in that in the book someone who talks about the feel of uh things the feel of ivory mm -hmm. yeah the feel of ivory that's it yeah mm -hmm. that's um, the the contribution by elena gertzman playthings mm -hmm. ivory and ivory yeah but it's so nice because nowadays when it comes to games we more and more talk as well about the experience about the multisensorial mm -hmm. about animals about the relation between war and games mm -hmm. and of course it's different but it also resonates with all the things you talk about in the book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about uh that it that it can be for everyone but it can also be quite uh um yeah mm -hmm. exclusive maybe in mm -hmm. a, of course in a total different way mm -hmm. so in a way um there's so many continuities and discontinuities at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think or some something that is i mean we 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 kind of excluded uh, physical games uh, in 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 the volume because I mean on purpose because <laughs> otherwise it would have been a box of Pandora and we would probably have published like three volumes. But there is what goes into your direction and also about the question of materiality and experience and touching and feeling is what um, historical um, sword sword fighting is doing where they're asking these questions and realizing that looking at manuals where you can which is also very visual visual because you can you have the gestures or the, the positions uh featured uh where they realize that it's it's not the same way contemporary people would move so um so it's either so we we again have this this uh difficulty to also um analyze the visual image that we have um, of what it represents um, and then maybe the realistic embodiment or, or enactment mm -hmm. of, of, of what we see um, but this is i mean um, this is just i mean if, if if you want to stay in touch i could i could give you a hint and, and and direct you to people who do that and who have been well, also I like thinking about that also like what is it to wear an armor and and these kind mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. it almost yeah. bags for a workshop this right if I, if you are, <laughs> how, the, how you can methodologically mm -hmm. um, but also uh, yes. my question which i i don't think i can answer that easily about that magic circle is that something which is particular to the modernist 
uh, mm -hmm. error? Or is that something which sometimes also, uh, and what is the difference then in how that magic circle was created in a medieval or renaissance yes. setting mm -hmm. from now? That's a very mm -hmm. interesting one because it tells us a lot about, like you said, with Huizinga, about mm -hmm. how culture works and how play figures in a culture um, um, not or more or less complex, not more or less um, um, but yeah, so it, is it true that it was more fluid in medieval mm -hmm. times when play was sure. on the table I, or not? I, I mean, I, I would I would say yes in a mm -hmm. lot of uh, in a lot of fields. Um, I would also, I mean, I would argue in, 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 in the specific games I researched and especially in conversational games, um, that it would be, I mean, and this also ties maybe to one of the questions that I saw in the chat. Um, it, it ties into like so much what has happened, what is happening in games um, has an effect on the world outside of games, which is something that Heusinger mm -hmm. um, kind of rebukes, but which I feel that a lot yeah. of political discussions, like a lot of political, also violent um, um, confrontation um, uh, gets sort of, the game becomes sort of an escapism of this violent situation, but still has an impact of it. Like it's the person who plays um, is not a completely different person in in the play moment, um, as in the canonical uh, description no. by Heusinger. So um, I would I would honestly like before the 15th like before the 16th centuries, uh, I, I would I would actually plead for a more fluid. Um, and less demarcated and less magical mm -hmm. circled. Still magical, but not circled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the feeling I had, but I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. But mm -hmm. of course, when it's a religious thing, it becomes quite close in a way. But even then, it depends yeah, especially where. Especially liturgy, yeah, or games yeah. that were played in liturgy. I mean, there has been there has been a lot of research done on, yeah, on on, on playing monks and about the incorporation of mm -hmm. ludic elements into religious aspects. Um, sure. So, but maybe another person might give you a completely different answer because they are examining other games. So, yeah, or other um, cultures, right? Yes, I yeah. think we cannot yeah. generalize on that. No, yeah, surely not. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the questions in the in the chat. So the first question was about the monkey, and there was already some 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 uh, answer by you, Vanina. But but you can every one of you you can when you put on the plus you can really zoom on the picture. So then you see indeed that monkey with a strange uh, roll, kind of indeed uh, something to put the grass more <laughs> more more at order in order to play. But what does this monkey has to do in this whole picture mm -hmm. of of the play in the game? How how does it work also with playground? Because who's playing and where is he or she playing and no. things like that? So mm -hmm. so it's indeed a very interesting question. Uh, what does the monkey do there? He's so obviously mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the monkey, but what I found fascinating in many of the uh, articles is that uh, images are not just flat images you see on the screen, but uh, looking at them, you also often engage in, in play, um, which is especially obvious with the, with the misericords. Uh, where you lift, you lift the, or you you lift the the seat, and you see some sort of a scene there. So you you're engaged in 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 play, with an image representing, often play. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something to ask, even even of of manuscripts. What game are you playing? What game was a medieval reader of a manuscript was was playing? Yeah, sure. While sure, looking sure. at this at this um, representation of play. And so this monkey could be also that kind of device in order to invite you to think about yourself as a reader of a manuscript, or maybe. <laughs> there are so many monkeys in medieval manuscripts That's of right. that period. So this is also, I mean, I'm 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 the text person, so maybe I'm completely wrong, but. Um, I also see it as a sign of the exclusivity of this aristocratic circle um, mm. that you know that is gathering in lavish uh, lavish clothes and has also a gesture 
uh, next to them and they are sitting in a castle and they have glass windows so mm -hmm. um i feel like the monkey also enhances this part of being yes. a society that is you know worldly and mundane and um mm -hmm. isn't the monkey playing as well no he has him he's like <laughs> doing the grass or something the idea it's, it's is the... that monkeys are playing right yeah and mowing mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. it, it should mm -hmm. be yeah Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the question by Larry. Larry Silver. So many Netherlandish images, paintings as well as prints show men versus women. So that's the gender aspect at chess or card games. As if a battle of the sexes, which differs from the courtly and aristocratic aspects mm -hmm. of the tabletops games. So in how far mm -hmm. can you say something about those more more or less 17th century rep uh, representations of games as a battle between the sexes? And in how far does that contrast with the image we just saw where uh, men mm -hmm. and women are playing together? Um, well, I can try to start answering from my perspective as someone who works on tax and who sees that a lot of game situation and chess is always the game that is chosen to depict an aristocratic circle. Um, they, yeah, they, they are just, they are one means to show the antagonistic and uh, the power shifting and the, the, the competitive, also social competitive um, aspect of a situation. Um, so, um, if you have an aristocratic circle and especially um, a couple, um, who would play and who would meet via play, or who would, you know, um, uh, discuss in a way the relationship via play, like who who is winning, who is losing. Um, uh, this is something that happens a lot in these courtly romances, uh, the Roman d'Alexandre, for example, which was on the image, but also in, in the Vue du Pont. Um, it is, uh, you, you bring antagonists on, on a chess table um, instead, you know, of giving them a sword. And especially when it's uh, men and women involved, because the chess or the tabletop uh, uh, game is one of the one of the games where they can actually play on, on equal, um, where they can participate both. Mm -hmm. um, so I, from my from, from the perspective of someone who works with these texts, I would say uh, to also really look at, at, at the textual situation where this chess uh, situation between men and women is placed, because most of the time we can, like, it, th there is a connection uh, between this and be, be, between the protagonists and because what is developed in the courtly romance. Um, yeah. I, I think we would we would have to look at the specific specific uh, pictures to be able to answer this this question mm -hmm. fully because uh, similarity in in form a man and a woman playing doesn't mean there's a continuity or similarity to it, to mm -hmm. another image and with men and women playing it's it's fascinating because it's not it's not as easy as battle of the sexes because often oftentimes for example losing actually means winning so losing and winning especially in the game between different genders it's all it's all upside down it's all very different mm -hmm. and it's very complicated not necessarily only between men and women but especially with men and women what it means to lose and what it means to win it's very different mm -hmm. from what we would interesting expect yes, yes indeed i hope that answers your question uh, larry uh last question maybe a bit outside of the time period jeff crouch says but what do you think of the list of games and the like in the work of rabelais and the mm -hmm. related analysis of bakhtin that's for vanina <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i mean uh this list of games in rabelais has is like so popular and it's like it pops up everywhere because I mean, and this ties back to what also uh, Sibylla said, it is one of the first lists that we have of games that are named. Um, I think it's over 100 games. Um, and, uh, um, and then, I mean, researchers have tried to reconstruct these games or like try to identify from other sources what these games were uh, because it is such a significant like um, yeah just like writing down the names of games 
when you didn't know, you know that people play, but you didn't know what they played. And then um, Bakhtin is also very, it's, it's a fascinating read, also in a stereographical um, uh, perspective, because, um, and it, it's, it has been challenged recently um, because um, like there's this very hard distinction that Bakhtin made between folklore and like aristocratic games and um, uh, has been challenged recently to like this more fluid um, and ubiquitous uh, perspective on games uh, in medieval societies and uh, not being so harsh on, on delimita delimitating certain games to certain uh, social groups. Um, so um, this is, yeah, this is just a moving field at the moment also in, in game studies and how to reread the big classics because obviously Bakhtin is a big classic. Uh, it's a seminal work. Um, and yeah, to, to kind of see this in the light of new, of new research. Oh, we cannot hear you. Yes, I just saw that. Sorry. Sibylla, do you work with Bakhtin or is that far too historical? No, well, I, I know Bakhtin and I do work with him, but for me, um, and that's something I still have to and uh, have to uh, um, explore more. Uh, for for in, in the work of Bakhtin, of course, the spectacle is quite important and the performative mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. And up till now, I'm far more interested in how, and that's also why there's a strong link between this book and my own work, between um, games in daily life and less with that sort of um, um, yeah carnivalesque aspect of it. But more like how do we make sense of things which are maybe friction well maybe unpleasant or not contradictory in daily life so that's also what i do with the with the work on post-colonial games how do we make sense of our history through games and mm -hmm. also with with the project i just described it's it's more about how did people play in daily life so that shifts the, uh, the, 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 the emphasis away from Bakhtin. But lately I have started a project with some other people about playing politics. Mm -hmm. And there he will, of course, have a probably a stronger role than he has had up till now in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Antonella writes that about love and games in medieval literature, chess can be used as a metaphor that conveys the helplessness of the lover which really says a lot about how different yeah. the experience of games that are familiar to us was in the Middle Ages. There's a nice article about it. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. because that's also now in the chat, the direct link to that mm -hmm. uh, to that article. So so thank you, Antonella, for that, that extra mm -hmm. information. And I think there's still one more question. Yeah. Oh, that's just a thank you. <laughs> so that's no, no real question. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yes, just, just give the last word to, to our authors, to the editors. Uh, Elizabeth? Well, I just want to ask a question uh, from Sibylle about post-colonial games, if you could just a, a quick a quick <laughs> summary. It's funny, Elizabeth, I just wanted to ask a question to you. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do do a lot. I did a lot of research about civilization, but also about uh, other uh, uh, games and partly also with Angus Mall at the moment um uh so uh th because that's a big hit right but we also started now to look in a block uh sort of uh a vignette at uh, a tabletop game uh the Catan uh, series and how that mm -hmm. worked with colonialism mm -hmm. and then there's a sort of the spin okay. uh, mm -hmm. game which is a sort of anti-colonial game mm -hmm. we play that together and then analyze it so playing mm -hmm. is very important in how we approach it mm -hmm. but i was also <laughs> I want to say something. Can I say one thing about chess? That's very interesting that chess is often played when people are confined or are imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And I was also wondering how that um, translates itself historically. But that's a quite a, I'm sure, you, well, maybe you have an answer to that. But now you see often when people are confined, it mm -hmm. also during the Second World War, that they draw their own chess uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. chess. Uh, uh, boards or whatever mm -hmm. and also uh, people especially in the United States who were imprisoned mm -hmm. learn chess in prison and then start to play it for example in New York to make mm -hmm. money to leave prison mm -hmm. so there's this intriguing uh, mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. between uh, 
mm-hmm. being confined and playing chess. Of course, also the book, the Schach novella, uh, mm-hmm. takes that as its starting mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Well, that's why that's how we justified just including uh, board games or tabletop games. It's games that women can play, that prisoners yeah. can play, sailors can play. Yeah. That's how they were defined defined in the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Games yeah. that people who are not necessarily yeah. cannot. So it's a it's a fantastic it. way of into daily life in that mm-hmm. time, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's also a fantastic way to end this presentation because now it's really a game open for everyone. Mm-hmm. So just I would like to finish with thank you, the three of you, Elizabeth, Sibylle. Vanina yeah, for a very interesting mm-hmm. presentation, but certainly also the discussion. I really like the discussion and how it opens up and how you really met. So in that way, thank you so much for being here. Also the whole audience. And uh, I hope that mm-hmm. we will meet each other very soon. Next presentation mm-hmm. book launch will be by Barbara Kaminska's uh, Images of Miraculous Healing. That's December the 2nd at 18 hours we start. Hope to see you all there. Bye bye. Have thank a wonderful you. evening. Thank you for thank having you so us. Much. And thank, thank you, Sibili. Bye bye. Thank you for moderating. Yeah.